Welcome to Chapter 10 of Same Lake, Different Boat, coming alongside people touched by disability. The title of Chapter 10 is On Hospitality, No Room at the Inn. In this chapter, Steph explores the essential question, what does it mean to be a church that practices biblical hospitality? I think when the word hospitality is mentioned, we often think a meal and sitting down over a table and having fun with someone that we know or that we want to get to know. But I think in, in a biblical sense, hospitality has a much deeper and, and richer meaning to it that uh, the hospitality of the gospel is that God came into our world and into our flesh to do radical things uh, by way of reaching into our needs, uh, ministering and showing His glory. And so I think hospitality as regards um, the special needs ministry is not just um, providing a meal or providing some way of, of helping with a, a physical circumstance in that family, but of really opening our hearts and beginning to, to welcome people into our lives uh, and, and to move into their lives uh, in a way where that brokenness um, on our part and on their part is exposed and we begin uh, to love in a truly deep way. To me, that's incredible because I think the, the ramp was sort of like it came into how we we're going to design this sanctuary and how it's going to work. And but I think every time I see John, you know, coming up that ramp, it's it to me, it's just like it's it's the gospel. You know, it's like this church is for everyone, and and uh, w whether up here or down below, you know, it just it just speaks loudly to me of the gospel. Um, we used to have a young individual who, he's not at our church anymore, but he had a, a, a disability and he had this really noisy walker that, and, and I don't even know if he was ever supposed to walk, but he, but, but he did. And he just kind of clacked down the aisle. I always knew when he was coming in, it would be like clack, 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 you know, and he's just kind of coming in the church and down the aisle. But, you know, th those things that you might think of as like, some might say our annoyances is that's kind of becomes music to your ears, you know, when when you see someone like that be a part of your body and a part of your fellowship, and to know that the, the gospel is just as much for that individual as it, as it is for me. Well, we our facility before we uh, rebuilt was sort of your typical disabilities uh, nightmare: stay away, you can't get in. And if you do, we can't do anything for you. And when we were in the building program, why, you know, we were being required to do all kinds of things by code that, uh, and some of us were scratching our heads, like, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to have this ramp up to the platform? Um, you know, and yet God used all those things despite some of our own resistance to prepare us for the ministry that we're in right now. The ramp gets used. Um, but the whole facility says welcome. I think just drawing the person in as part of the congregation and not treating them as an outside. So really the essential question of this chapter is, what does it mean uh, to be a church that practices biblical hospitality? And a lot of times when we think about hospitality, we think about entertainment, right? We think about having people in that we entertain for a meal or, uh, or, uh, or that type of thing. And, that, and yet that's not at all really an accurate picture of what hospitality uh, looks like in the scriptures. It's a much broader concept than that. So, um, you know, if you look at, at when Jesus arrived um, through his birth at Bethlehem, um, and we look at the passage in Luke 2, it says, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for him, them at the inn. And I think for people um, who have disabilities, the history has often been that there's been no room at the inn. Um, and so uh, this is one of, another one of those ways in which, when we talked about identification, that Jesus identifies um, with people and with people in particular who have uh, disabilities. And what happens in the, in the church sometimes is that, is that um, while there may be times that people say, well, you can come on in, but well, the best we can do for you is really that stable, you know, that's over there in the back backyard. And that's really been in many ways the picture for what has, has happened for people with disabilities in the life of the church. 
And, and so uh, in the next chapter, we're going to talk about the whole idea of, of belonging and what does belonging look like in the body of Christ. But in order to get to the part about belonging, we really have to talk about welcoming. And so that's why I really want to talk about hospitality this evening. You know, welcoming church is a hospitable church. And the word hospitality really means the love of a stranger. And when you think about even what the word a hospital, right, a hospital is a place where it's a stranger, where it's safe for a stranger to come and have their needs met. And so um, uh, there was a friend of ours that we knew in State College, a, a young man who had uh, autism, se severe autism and, uh, and, and intellectual disabilities. And uh, when we lived in the State College area, we knew their family. David was about 13 at that, that time. And a uh, number of years later, when he was in his early 20s, uh, he was placed in a group home that was uh, north of this area in uh, the Reading area. And... Uh, because of the high level of needs that he had, it was difficult for his folks to, to find a group home setting, and they finally found a good group home setting for him in that area. And so what happened was um, um, his folks tried to stay involved as much as they could from the distance that there was uh, between State College and, and this area. And, and they got a phone call one night from the staff person at the, at the group home, and they said, you know, um, uh, David is bleeding profusely from the mouth, and we don't know why. And so his mom, you know, started assessing real quickly. Uh, well, he, you know, he had seizures, and so he'd had his medications changed recently. Maybe he had uh, had a seizure and bit in his tongue. So she said, just get him to the ER, you know, get him looked at and see what, see what they say. So they took him to the ER, and uh, he was bleeding profusely. Took him into the ER. He's obviously distraught. And the physician took one look at him and said, we can't deal with this. And they sent him home. They didn't, they didn't find another facility. They didn't find another physician. They didn't do anything to suture his tongue. They didn't even examine him. They just sent him home. And so what happened is it took another, it really took another 24 hours of the family getting involved and the staff to actually get him into a facility where he could be sedated and his tongue could be sutured. And here's a, the short story long is that he ended up losing a third of his tongue to gangrene because of that. And, um, and I was just shocked when I heard that story. Uh, and then I thought about it. I thought, that's what we've done in the church. You know, there have been people who have come to our doors with a variety of different ways that they're bleeding. You know, that they're, that, that they're suffering in one area or another of life, and, and particularly in the area of disability. And we've said, you know, we can't deal with, with this. And, and so how can we be a... As, as Puritan Richard Sibb said, how can we be a hospital for sinners, right? A, a place where it's safe for a stranger to come and have their needs met. How can we be a place where the love of a stranger really, really takes place? Um, the, the problem that we find in, in churches often is that we're not hospitals for sinners. We're country clubs for members only. And, and, that's, and that's a hard truth about the way that we do church life sometimes. So uh, let's look a little bit about this whole idea of, of hospitality. And, and, you know, if you think about the whole idea of this country club mentality, right, the whole idea of a country club for members only, who were the folks in Jesus' day who uh, ran the exclusive environments? Right, it was the Pharisees. Right. And so um, if you listen to, to what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew uh, 23, 23, and 24, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Um, Jesus was trying to get the Pharisees to see, yes, right, these things that you're doing are, are important and they do matter, but in the big scheme of things, you're missing the big picture. And so why do you think that Jesus picked those three characteristics, justice, mercy and faithfulness, I think he picked them because they really represent the character of God. And, and what he wanted the, 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 the Pharisees to get off of was their focus on the law and instead their focus on the love of God as, as the bigger picture that they needed to see. Um, if you look at uh, uh, the, the way that the Pharisees were approaching their world, they were essentially saying, they were essentially duty driven in the way that they were looking at life. And duty asked, what must I do? Right? What must I do? And, and Jesus was trying to direct them to a, to a more gospel-oriented type of question, a, a question that was really from the heart of the love of God that says, how can I love as I've been loved? Can you see how that's an entirely different question when you look at a relationship with someone? What must I do versus how can I love as I've been loved? 
And when you think about the whole idea of hospitality being the love of a stranger, how can I love a stranger in, in, this, in the ways that I've been loved by God? And um, so what, let's look a little bit at this whole idea of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. What, how, do, how do we define what those are? Uh, how, how can we um, look at how those relate in, in particular to relationships with people who are affected by disability? Uh, where are some of the obstacles in terms of really actually living those out in congregational life? And then what are some of the ways we can practice those? So as far as definitions, I, I think the, that you can look at the idea of justice, for example, and say uh, justice is really the appropriate use of power to do what's right and fair. The appropriate use of power to do what's right and fair. Um, if you look at the idea of mercy, mercy, and I like the definition from St. Gregory of Nyssa, he says, mercy is a voluntary sorrow which enjoins itself to the suffering of another. And then the idea of faithfulness is simply commitment for the duration. Commitment for the duration. So if we look at what, what these have to do with disability, um, the idea of justice, right, this idea of the appropriate use of power to do what's right and fair, really has, it really correlates to that idea about disability having a social dimension. Remember how we talked about that, how disability, there's a social dimension of disability and there's a functional dimension? Um, if you think about the social dimension of disability, the idea that attitudes disable, um, what happens with justice-oriented issues often is that, is that there are attitudes behind the scene that then translate into actions that actually oppress. And oppression is just simply the antithesis of, of justice, right? Oppression is the holding down of another. And so, um, you know, in terms of, of the, the role of the church, whenever we see injustice, our, our role in the lives of people with disabilities is to really, is to um, push back against injustice wherever that might occur. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like sometimes, but that's especially true on behalf of people who don't have a voice, right? Especially people, for example, with intellectual disabilities who may or may not be able to um, stand up for themselves and to be able to actually uh, respond to some of the types of, of uh, oppression or um, injustice that occurs in their lives. Um, functional uh, aspects of disability is, is related to mercy, right? Mercy is more, not entirely, but, but primarily mercy corresponds to this functional piece of the impairment, the part of the body that doesn't work as we expect it to, right? And so, so how do we enter in, in mercy and provide assistance, right? And, and be really engaged in the life of a person with a disability. That's the, the mercy piece. And then the faithfulness has to do with that whole subject of relentlessness that we talked about when we, back when we talked about the life of Joseph, right? This whole idea that, that uh, disability is not like cancer, right? You don't get to the other side of it. And so um, the gospel response uh, to uh, disability in, in congregational life is it, 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 when it comes to the idea of faithfulness is that we engage uh, people with disabilities for the long haul, right? And we stay engaged in their lives and, and remain faithful just like God is faithful to us. And so... Uh, the next, I don't know if you have well, you can see that picture. The next thing you're thinking is, okay, I, I can get that. I get the definition of justice. I get the definition of mercy. I get the definition of faithfulness. I get that justice corresponds to the social aspects of disability. I get that mercy corresponds to the uh, functional aspects of disability. I get that faithfulness corresponds to relentlessness. And, uh, and that would and that would be really simple if it wasn't that for the matter of our hearts, right? <laughs> and that's why I have this picture up here. So my, I, I got this off of the internet somewhere. I love this picture. These two pilots and they they're looking back smiling, and then you can see the airplane coming straight at their windshield. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of what uh, a lot of biblical principles are like. That we're like you know we turn back and smile like I get that, you know. <laughs> and the, the the thing that's careening towards right towards us is really our our own uh, sinful hearts and how much that gets in the way of us acting being able to do uh, what we understand to be uh, what God calls us to do. And so what are three of the big challenges that I think uh, we all struggle with when it comes to trying to really be uh, the people of God who live out justice, mercy, and faithfulness in congregational life? Um, well, they're pretty much three, uh, three simple things, I think. They're simple in the sense that they're pretty clear-cut. Uh, that thing, like my dad says, Christianity says, it's simple, uh, simple not, but it's not easy, right? <laughs> and, uh, and the first one is self-reliance. Uh, we have uh, one of our idols is we like to do things ourselves, right? We like to be self-reliant, and we don't. And, and so, what the way that that works itself out when we're trying to engage people in justice, mercy, or faithfulness is that we try to fix things, right? We we will have a tendency to either want to fix 
a situation that somebody is struggling with, we'll have a tendency to want to oversimplify it so that we can pretend that it could be fixed, right? Um, so that's one of the one of the obstacles of our hearts. Uh, the second one is this idea of self protection, that we really don't want to feel the pain, you know, of other people. We really don't want to, to be involved in the difficulty, and so we'll have a tendency to either avoid um, or ignore or invalidate the needs of others. That's another way that our hearts get in the way of, of being effective this way. <clears throat> and then the other one is the idea of self promotion, which is that whole uh, idea of operating from a position of power. And you know, if you if we're still carrying around in our minds the whole idea of of uh, that disability is an abnormal part of life in an otherwise normal world, we'll have this superior inferior type of view of people, and we'll, we'll be self promoting in the ways that we want to work with people and operate in our relationships. And so we'll want to operate from a position of power. So self reliance, self protection, self promotion—they're three of the heart issues that we bring to the table in terms of of being able to be congregations that love as we've been loved. Um, and so what does that translate to in terms of, in terms of pr uh, practical barriers that people run into in the church in terms of being welcomed? What, why is it that welcoming is something we struggle with? Uh, the first one is, is uh, and so this is kind of like what I did a couple weeks ago. It's one thing comes from one direction, one thing comes from another. And so I'm, I'm telling you, I have issues of the heart that go this way, and then it ends up working itself out in certain practices that we do this way. So anxiety is the first one. I gave you four A's, a little Presbyterian uh, thing, you know, <laughs> got to give you four matching letters. So uh, it makes it easy to remember. And uh, anxiety, and that breaks down pretty much into uh, warranted and unwarranted fears, right? And so um, we have a tendency to uh, uh, not be hospitable at times because we're fearful. And, and so and we're fearful of what it might cost us. We're fearful of our lack of knowledge. And so um, the unwarranted fears are, are really the ones that can be remedied by education. They're, they're things like just really simply not having exposure to, to something. And therefore, a little bit of education goes a long way in terms of a, addressing an, an unwarranted fear. Um, if a child's in Sunday school and they're sitting next to a child that has Down syndrome and they think they're going to catch it, right? That's an unwarranted fear that you're going to catch Down syndrome. And so a little education to a child helps alleviate that, that fear. Adults, we carry around all sorts of other different, often unnamed fears in our minds when it comes to, to disability. Warranted fears are fears that have some basis in reality, right? And, and uh, one of the big issues that comes up with churches in the area of warranted fears is, is the subject of liability. And so churches get all hung up on, on liability. And my word to churches in general about that comes back to, to loving well, right? If, we, if, we, if our object is to love well and love deeply, um, then we minimize liability by definition. Because if you love someone well and care for them well, it's, then you, you uh, do the things that are going to be what, what really meets that person's needs and, and keeps them uh, reasonably safe. So... Um, that, there's that issue of anxiety, which becomes one of the practical barriers. The second one is the idea of architecture. And, and church buildings are really, and, and here's one example, a church building that is inaccessible reflects in many ways the attitudes of our heart, right? The things that we haven't ever really even considered as being important to another human being. So it just shows our lack of love when we have a building that, that doesn't make it possible for a person with disabilities uh, to enter. Um, but but architecture can be changed reasonably um, simply. It's expensive, but it can it can be done. It's the it's the invisible architecture, which is the other idea, and that's the church culture, right? Every every church has its own culture, its unwritten values that are the ones that that a congregation operates by, not necessarily the ones that are written down in the threefold uh, brochure that you pick up in the lobby. <laughs> so, um, uh, so the. Uh, Invisible architecture of the church is one of the real challenges because churches will often have these unwritten values they operate by. And, and I sometimes I'll tell people they're kind of like the pink collar on a dog, you know, and it, you don't know it's there till you step on it, right? And then the dog goes ballistic. And I think church culture is a little bit, a little bit like that too. So uh, one of the, one of the things that we have a tendency to do is we'll have certain things that they're not inherently bad values. Let's say you have uh, a value of excellence, right? And so you have this this unwritten value of excellence in your congregation, and that's great. But what is that? what happens then when a person with a developmental disability wants to sing in the choir and they don't have perfect pitch, right? 
do you see where the, all of a sudden the, the value, which in and of itself isn't, isn't an immoral value, right? But it becomes, when it becomes an idol, because it gets in the, it, and it gets in the way of loving other people, then you have to start to, to wrestle with that. And so these issues of justice, mercy, faithfulness, all have to do with addressing these kind of, these kind of uh, ways that, that, uh, that we have create our own challenges in church life. The next one has to do with attitudes. And, and some of these have to do with issues of the heart, and some of these don't. Uh, the first one is ignorance. And ignorance generally does not have to do with issues of the heart. Ignorance is just simply the idea we don't know. And that is, is easily remedied through information. Uh, the second one is indifference, which is more of an issue of the heart because it's we know, but we don't care. Um, and that. Um, really is one of the things that starts to really affect the climate of a church in terms of issues related to, to justice. Uh, and then the third one is the worst one of the combination, which is arrogance, which is we're superior. It <laughs> doesn't matter what we know. It doesn't matter whether we care. We're better anyway. And, and so when you run into superiority uh, uh, attitudes, then, then that also creates a real, a real issue in, in churches. And the last A is the one of agendas. Uh, all of us have agendas. We talked about this last week. Agendas are one of the ways that we get things done, right? And they have to do with goals that we'd like to accomplish. But um, when our agendas become more important than loving our neighbor, then we have to call the agenda into question, right? And really start to get our priorities straight in terms of loving God and neighbor first in all things and the agenda becoming secondary to that. And, and it was really hard to believe that in, co in congregational life that there could actually be agendas. <laughs> Any pastor will tell you that, that there are distinct lobbying groups all over his congregation who have different agendas for, for different things. And, uh, you know, disability ministry can become an agenda. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the last chapter of the book is how do you, how do you try to keep that from becoming an agenda in the life of the church in, in terms of uh, the way it drives things. So I think that the big scripture that I try to really uh, emphasize in terms of the whole issue of agendas is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 20, 25, which talks about the whole idea of showing equal concern for each other. That's kind of the, the principle that we really try to use in the work that I do is saying, how do we create a win-win situation in church life where, where the welcoming of people with disabilities creates a win-win for everybody in the body of Christ? And, and sometimes we'll talk about how, how M&A Special Needs is not a disability rights organization. It's a bless all the body of Christ organization because there are lots of ways to welcome people in a way that, that benefits everybody. Um, and so... The attitudes of our hearts, the airplane careening towards the windshield, create these these issues with uh, um, anxiety and and uh, and attitudes and agendas and what was my fourth one? Architecture. Um, let's talk about some of the practical applications when we're talking about this idea of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Um, what do you what, what does it look like in congregational life um, in terms of addressing these particular? Issues. If we want to get out of the, the pharisaical, duty-driven approach to ministry, and instead we want to really love um, as we've been loved by God, how do, we, how do we look at these particular things? Well, the issue of justice, um, as I mentioned uh, before, is really the appropriate use of power to do what's right and fair. So there are two types of injustice you can really encounter in congregational life. The first one, I hope we hardly ever see in congregational life, which would be active oppression, right? Which would be the whole idea of um, the intentional holding down of another through the use of, of power in a way that's immoral and inequitable, all right? And so you occasionally hear stories in the news that have to do with people with disabilities who have been um, told that they cannot come to a congregation or have been, have even when there have been court orders for people not with autism and all not to attend particular congregations. And again, I don't know, always know the story behind that. I mean, there's probably a bigger picture behind that story as well. But the, the whole idea that, that there isn't any better win-win solution to come to than, uh, than actively uh, taking a, a, a stance with a court order, uh, it's a little bit hard to, hard to imagine. And so the whole idea of, um, of active injustice is this idea of, of just intentionally saying, no, right? No, we will not. You, you are not welcome here. And so, um, so as Christians, that's something that we should always be uh, working ag against in, in congregational life. If we ever come across situations where there's active, intentional injustice against people, that that needs to be remedied. But the thing that you see almost 
all the time in churches uh, is not this idea of, of active oppression, but it's passive, what I call passive oppression, which is more just the whole idea of the holding down of another through what isn't done, through neglect, through simply just not thinking about it, not acting on it, just not doing anything. And, um, and, and that uh, is, is, is what, it, in a lot of ways, congregations just really need to spend time being self-reflective about what is it about uh, our congregation, either in the way that our building is constructed or in the way our church culture operates or in the way we do Sunday school, right, or in any number of different, different arenas. What are ways that we might be practicing passive Oppression, the holding down of another through what is not done in the way that we do church life. And so um, there are lots of different ways to do that. You can do an accessibility check of your congregation and of your church culture. You can educate your congregation on disability through a variety of different means. Uh, you can intentionally create access where there are barriers that you've identified. You can use a buddy system in Sunday school. You can build a ramp. You can adapt curriculum. You can facilitate worship. There are a lot of different ways that you can actually push back in terms of, um, of ways that you've been practicing passive opp oppression and instead choose to, to practice justice in, in congregational life. Um, as far as mercy goes, remember, mercy has to do with this functional dimension associated with disability. And there, the, the three uh, terms that are in that NISA definition of mercy, I think, are just really helpful. It, mercy is a voluntary sorrow which enjoins itself to the suffering of another. So it's voluntary, it's engaged, and it's personal. Okay, it's voluntary, it's engaged, and it's personal. Um, it's voluntary uh, in the sense that then in terms of welcoming people with disabilities and, and the difficulties that come with functional impairments, you stop and listen, right? You want to hear their story. You need to know what is it ab about their life where their challenges are and, and how you can enter into that. Um, engage is choosing to feel the pain. It's choosing to participate in life with them, choosing to work alongside of them to bring about adaptations where those might be necessary or to enter in and provide practical assistance in areas where they're experiencing some challenges in life. Um, and it's personal. That means actually offering to act. Um, mercy isn't really mercy uh, unless you're really engaged in it personally, because mercy is not a program. And I think one of the ways that we get ourselves in trouble in church life sometimes is we have a tendency to think, first of all, we try to solve universal needs instead of really dealing with people as individuals. And when we deal with people as individuals and we meet needs on a personal level and we do it in a relational way, then we're able to practice mercy. And when we try to build a program that, that uh, addresses a universal problem, all of a sudden the personal dimension is, is out of it. And so we might be able to be voluntary, we might be able to even be engaged, but if we're not be, really being personal, then mercy isn't going to be really felt in the heart of another human being. Uh, disability is relentless, right? We've talked about that before. And uh, in terms of, of faithfulness, uh, sometimes I think faithfulness is one of the hardest things about being a welcoming church because uh, that's one of the things that people struggle with, I think, in terms of the anxiety issue and the self-protective uh, issue of the heart is, is not wanting to get involved because they know this isn't like cancer, right? You don't get to the other side of it. So that the, the, the walk alongside of a family affected by disability is a long walk, right? It's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so um, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of these areas of justice, mercy, faithfulness, in many ways, faithfulness is the one where the rubber really, really meets the road. And I think if you think about it this way, faithfulness loves relentlessly, relentlessly in the face of relentlessness. Faithfulness loves relentlessly in the face of relentlessness. Because that's the way God loves us, right? God doesn't say, well, you know, I think I've really doled out enough for Ruth this week, right? <laughs> he, he, just, he, he loves us faithfully and with, just without limits. And so um, th this is the area of of congregational life in terms of welcoming that's the most uh, puts us, makes us most dependent on the Holy Spirit because we can't love faithfully for the duration in our own strength. And, um, and so uh, one of the things that in terms of actually practicing faithfulness in congregational life is, is the reality that we have to expect that circumstances will change. You know, when you're faithfully serving a family affected by disability, you may have some type of setup for their child in Sunday school, and they may be there two weeks and then gone for three, and then you know, be there one and then gone for two. And, and, and that's just the nature of the journey because that's the nature of what their life 
is like in some of the challenges of, of living with disability at home. And so being faithful to those families means being able to be a lot more flexible than we have a tendency to be at times. Um, and some of it, too, it really involves creating vehicles that really facilitate engagement so you can stay engaged. Let's say you have somebody who isn't able to come to church because of uh, some type of a challenge they have in their life that they either really can't participate in the service or they maybe they have a, a chronic illness and they can't be involved. And so uh, you can always bring the church to them. And so there are lots of ways that you can, in order to be faithful, that the church can create vehicles that actually facilitate engagement. And we had a, a situation with a, a fellow at our church, and I think I've mentioned in, in an earlier talk, uh, who ended up living in a nursing home in his 40s because of a, a a type of dementia that he had. And we had a team of fellows from church that rotated through uh, visiting him uh, every week for years and years and years. And and so so one of the ways to be faithful to his family, even if this fellow couldn't attend church, was to be welcoming to him by showing up where he lived, right? And so so that was just a, a practical way to, to practice that. Um, how we treat people with differing abilities is really in many ways, a window into our own heart motives behind our behavior, right? And so uh, it, the good question to ask ourselves is always, are we a hospital for sinners or are we a country club for members only? Um, true hospitality will reveal itself as the love of a stranger, and it will do so in justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So the next time a family affected by disability comes to your church door, what will you say? We can't deal with this. Or, come on in, we'd love to have you here. In his incarnation, Jesus identified with those who knew what it was like to be unwelcome. And in his ministry, Jesus, a stranger himself, was known for his dramatic demonstrations of hospitality to others. His church is meant to be a refuge where hospitality the love of a stranger, uniquely reflects Jesus' example. May the day come when people with disabilities are welcomed into congregations that offer justice in the form of access for all, mercy that is voluntary, engaged, and personal, and faithfulness that lovingly demonstrates unwavering commitment for the journey. Please take a few moments to listen to the following interviews and consider the questions posed at the end of each segment. You know, just how to come alongside of someone who is different. To be able to use a gentle touch or a softly spoken word and to let God do the work. I mean, it's all about showing up and, and not thinking, oh, how am I going to deal with this situation? But, you know, just being available for God to use, to use us. What does David mean by it's all about showing up? They are the ones who really desire to come to church but have that barrier. So as that has finally started to cement in, now we need a theology because, as you know, this is 10th. And if there's not some type of teaching or spiritual understanding from God's Word, we really don't move forward. We really do freeze in our tracks. But that's why it was so good to have you come and start teaching from the book. Being able to see again and be challenged from Scripture of the truth of saying this is normative. Limitations are normative in this broken world, but we should be the celebratory community. We should be able to be the ones who make life out of ashes. How is your congregation a celebratory community that brings life out of ashes? Well, it really turns up the heat on that because I spent enough time in a wheelchair in the beginning to know that places that say they're handicap accessible, some of them are not as friendly as others. Um, and I just, you know, you become aware when it's more difficult to move from place to place when your mobility is an issue that not all accessible things are equal. And so um, I think my, my senses are heightened and I'll, I'll take a look at something and think, 
Well, I could do that, but do I really want to because it's going to be a strain? One of the interesting things that I have discovered is the, um, the ramps. Ramps are wonderful for people with wheelchairs. For me, they're a problem because it's difficult for an amputee to motivate on, uh, to maneuver on a, a, a sloping surface. So I prefer going up and down the steps. And I decided to come up on the platform one day for something that we were doing and there were flowers all along the handrails. So they had to really reach out to grasp the handrail. Um, so just, it's one of those things that nobody ever thought that somebody would really need that handrail. So we'll decorate it. <laughs> I, I think one of the problems is we are a reading, writing society and some of those folks do not have those abilities. And I'm not sure we always take into consideration the needs of those who are not as verbal as the rest of us. What are some of the ways that we can create barriers unintentionally? 